um, paid attention to the words of the last song that we sang here, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. As they were going this morning, I was looking at those words pretty intently. And if you look, it says, uh, uh, and we repeated it in, in the chorus, Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Uh, and, and that's a great perspective to have uh, at all times. And the, the last verse says, his word shall not fail you. He promised, believe him and all will be well. Then go to a world that is dying, his perfect salvation to tell. Isn't that what we're supposed to be doing? Marvelous, marvelous lyrics there uh, for us to look at today. Um, you know, we talk a lot about, you, you've, you've heard this more in years past than probably now, but it's still out there. People talk about what would Jesus do? You know, WWJD, I remember when the bracelets were hot and the t-shirts and everything had WWJD all over it. And it was a craze going on. Um, and, and, it, and, and it certainly was popular and, and it remains to be popular to some degree. And at first glance, you would think then, you would think now. That is a good question to ask yourself. You won't hear any different from me that it's not a good question to ask. However, uh, when you truly start to think about it, the question itself is a little bit harder for people to, than what people realize it is. What would Jesus do? Okay. Uh, the first thing you got to look at when you ask yourself that question uh, is that, you know, can we really claim to know how Jesus would respond? in every situation that comes up in our life? Do you know that? Do you claim that? To any, any situation that comes up in your life, you say, oh, I, I can figure exactly how Jesus would respond to that. If, you, if you're that way, then you're better than me. I don't think that I can. And, and, and if you were to go and ask, and I think we can demonstrate it, if you were to ask people in this room, uh, let's just say 10 of you in this room, and give you a situation and say, how would Jesus respond? What would Jesus do? You'd probably have very indifferent answers among the people uh, out there. I think Jesus would do that, or I think Jesus would do that. And I just don't think that it's really a good practice for people to do things depending on what they think Jesus would do, okay? Uh, really and truly what happens is what would Jesus do becomes W-D-I-W-T-D. What do I want to do? Okay, that's what people do. They'll go, what do I want to do? So I'm going to ask, what would Jesus do? And if I can make a claim that that's what Jesus would do, then that validates what I want to do. Okay, is that supposed to be all about? No. Um, we justify our behaviors and actions and reactions by falsely imagining that Jesus would agree with us. I said this a couple of weeks ago. I think the Florida fans think that Jesus agreed with them yesterday. And I got a, post, I got a text message a while ago from an from a, uh, off-the-record reporter uh, that they may be changing the Georgia score here a little bit. The counting's still happening. Uh, <laughs> so the, uh, but, you know, when we get into football... I said this before, it just, it's crazy. Uh, you know, you got people going, I'm praying that this team wins. And the other people say, I'm praying to the same God that this team wins. God is not crazy. He's not sitting there going, ooh, which one do I favor more today? I mean, uh, and, and all, the, all of those types of things. You say, well, well, Jesus, he surely would be a Florida fan or a Georgia fan, you know, or whatever the case may be. Uh, we, that's trivial. But we get into big issues, too, where we say that we think, that Jesus uh, would do this or do that, and, and it's really maybe not justified uh, outside of our own brains. Um, when, you, when you take a look uh, at the scripture, Jesus is about denying oneself, taking up the cross, and following him. Okay, we talked about that uh, several Wednesday nights ago, uh, that there are costs. Uh, to discipleship. So I, again, I just want to caution you when you look at WWJD that I, I just don't know that it's possible for you to know how Jesus would react if he were here in every situation that comes up uh, in 
life, and you got to be cautious to not put your own spin on it. The second thing is, do we really know the mind of Christ? Do we really know uh, every intricate detail? Did you know how Jesus thinks about everything? You know his view on every single thing uh, that is out there? I don't know. Isaiah 55, 8 through 9 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. Thank the Lord. Okay? And that says, declares the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm glad his thoughts are not our thoughts. I'm glad his ways are not our ways. It's not about us superimposing on Jesus what our thought about something is. It's about us renewing our mind and changing our mind and conforming it to what his thoughts are about it. And when you do WWJD, you better be sure that you are not trying to superimpose what you want to do. And people say, the Lord spoke to me. I've heard people say this all so many times. I have had people come to me and say, the Lord told me to do something. And it wasn't no time. They were back coming to me telling me the Lord was telling them now something different than what he told them the time before. And I thought, he, he's not indecisive. We are. What you say, that sounds better when you say it, when you come to say, you know, I, I'm going to leave the church. The Lord told me to leave the church. Okay, well, how am I supposed to argue with that? You know, you got some people who go, oh, no, run after them and get them. They sat there and told me the Lord said that they were going to leave, for them to leave. I'm not arguing with God. So people get mad. They say, well, I left the church. Corey didn't run after me. You told me God told you to. I mean, what am I supposed to run? No, you know, disobey God. You know, what? Don't say it if you didn't mean it, if he really didn't say it. And I'm using that as an example, not of one that I have in my head of a real occasion, but I'm sure that's happened like that before. But they'll say, God told me to do something. And all of those things are, are very true. It can be God told you to do something. It can be that you're looking to see what you think Jesus may have done and that that may be a noble cause. But you have to be careful that you are not just trying to superimpose your thoughts and things on, on others because we don't really know the mind of God. It's impossible for a finite mind to know an infinite mind. Uh, So can we comprehend the mind of God through our own limited intellect? I say no. Are we capable of probing into areas that God has not revealed to us? You think about that for a moment. We know what we have been revealed through God's word. There are other things that have yet to be revealed to us. Uh, In Deuteronomy 29, 29, it says this, the secret things belong to who? The Lord our God. But the things revealed belong to who? Us and to our children forever, that we may follow all the words of this law. Okay? So you that's why, folks, I am I am a sola scriptura believer. I believe in solely scripture. I do not preach, and I, I can't say that. I can't say I have not, but I try not to preach speculation. All right? If I do so, I try to tell you, hey, this is Corey's words. This is Corey's interpretations. You've heard me say that before. This is the way I look at it. I can't be totally sure about it. But I try to take you to the scripture, what has been revealed to me, not, and I may have interpreted that, and I'll tell you, I've interpreted this, but you should not listen to speculation and people talking about things. That, oh, uh, for instance, you know, you'll have some people, some people to say uh, that, uh, in an end times prophecy uh, that the United States will be totally decimated in some act of uh, uh, world terror and mass destruction. They'll nuke us, for instance. Let's just say they'll say that. How do you know that? The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible hasn't been revealed. The only thing we do know is that a world power such as the United States, all the way where we are is not mentioned in the Bible. So then you would assume that that we're not who we are today, so something's going to come down. So what I'm saying, if you were going to talk about that, you would probably need to say, hey, the the United States is not mentioned as a world power in the Bible like you would have thought it was, so here's a list of things that could have possibly happened, but I'm speculating about that, okay? That's the way that you ought to do that. But some people are pounding the pulpit. This is exactly what's going to happen uh, about things. There's a huge, you know, uh, 
from Genesis to Revelation that people do that in. Uh, I just picked one of those things there. Um, and, and we get outside of what God has expressly revealed to us. Some things are mysteries because he wants them to be that way. We will not know everything here, so no, we are not capable. We are capable of probing into those things, but we're not capable of knowing uh, uh, something that is not yet revealed to us. So instead of WWJD, it is really helpful for us to ask ourselves, what did Jesus say? We say that we need to get back to God's word. I want you to know something. You will never go wrong getting to what Jesus said but you will get into a wrong direction trying to get outside of what he said and outside of his word and you trying to write your own Bible, all right? That will, you will get an immense error for that. When we look to God's word, it will inform us on what Jesus actually did, not what we think he may do. We'll be able to see what did he do? What did he say? How did he react? when you look at a particular account. And then you'll look at what we are expressly told to do. This is what should guide us, not simply what we think Jesus would have done in a particular circumstance. So in Matthew chapter 5, looking at these 10 verses, 11 verses and 38 through 48, it says, you have heard that it was said, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if someone wants to sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. If someone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who asks you, and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it is said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you, if you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your brothers, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Uh, this is, of course, an excerpt from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5. It is an extremely wonderful uh, chapter of the Bible to read, uh, and you see what Jesus is saying. He's, he's referenced two popular mindsets, all right, uh, that people had in those days. You could maybe call them rules, if you will, that people had in the ancient world during this time. One was like in Hammurabi's Code, an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. You know, you stab somebody's eye, and it was their right eye, guess what happened to you? As a punishment, huh? You had your right eye plucked out or, or stabbed out, not your left one, but the right one. You got exactly what you did. So sometimes we advocate in our own justice system something like that. You know what? If somebody was murdered in this way, we ought to murder them in that same way. And they don't like the capital punishment that we have right now is, is really a lesser form than what they do for other people. It is that eye for eye, tooth for a tooth. There is no mercy, there is no grace involved in that. It is just you flat get what you deserve. Religiously speaking, spiritually speaking, do you want that? Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. It says for the wages of sin is death. Romans 3.23 says for all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Well, by that rule, if it's eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, we get hell immediately. So you don't want that. And Jesus, after he says, after he references both eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, then he says uh, in, in verse 43, you have heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. So he's wanting them to talk about these two mindsets right here. On one side you have, you know, you get what you got coming to you because that's what you gave out. The other side, he says, you know what it says, love your, your neighbor but hate your enemy. These are the mindsets that the people had. After every time, so after he said, I for I, tooth for tooth, in verse 39, it starts out, but I tell you. Title this morning is, what did Jesus say? He said, but I tell you. And if you look in verse 43, 44, excuse me, after he said that about love your, uh, your neighbor and hate your enemy, he says, but I tell you, you ought to listen to that, right? We ought to have our, our ears in tune to what Jesus is saying to us clearly. 
And if you look, and, and in your paper notes, if you got them, uh, I have put, and I try to say, let's be real clear what Jesus is saying in these verses. Number one, he says, do not resist an evil person. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Man, I have read these y'all have preached on before. That one always got me. I thought, well, I'm just going to have to, you know, ask for forgiveness about that because you slapped me on my cheek, I am, on my right one. I'm not going to turn my left one until you've lost your mind. I may slap you on your right cheek, but I, was, I just couldn't understand that, uh, why he would say such a thing. My mama told me that if, 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 if they, if I don't start nothing, but, you know, if somebody else starts it, you finish it, is what she told me. So uh, I was kind of using my mama's words <laughs> to trump what the Bible was saying. But, it's, but even though I kind of had a problem for many years uh, as a kid, especially growing up with this verse, did it make that verse not say what it really says? It says what it says. It means what it means. Um, and the second one is someone wants to sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. You know? So if they want to take your shirt, give them your jacket. <laughs> What's a lawyer for? I mean, you know, you need a lawyer in that thing. You just, oh, you, you, you're suing me for 100000 Here's 500000 Have it. Yeah, take the house. Yeah, take the kids. I don't know. That may be a bargaining chip. I don't know. Uh, but... If someone, this is something, the third one, y'all, is something that, you know, Chick-fil-A got good service. You, you know, they, they have impeccably good service, you know, 97% of the time. You know the reason for that? Is they teach this third one. It's to talk to every single employee. If someone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. It's called second mile service. In the Roman world, you were required to carry the, the uh, soldiers' boots and whatever uh, for a mile. Jesus said you were to carry it too. Go an extra mile, okay? Uh, give to the one who asked you, and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. Well, that kind of hurts me in banking, and those times I've had to deny people loans. But it's not my money, so I guess it doesn't apply. That's the bank's money. Uh, but it's, and if y'all all get after it, you read this, and y'all come wanting to borrow some money from you, I'm, I don't know what I'm going to do after having read this verse. But it says, give to the one who asks, do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Did Jesus mean what he says here? Absolutely. Absolutely. No question about that he meant that. And all of the statements that Jesus is speaking here, he's talking about personal retaliation. Okay? Personal retaliation. He gives examples of personal slights that may come your way. Somebody slapping you, for instance, all right, that does not have to involve, as you may think, somebody physically abusing you. It doesn't have to be that somebody literally slapped you across your face. Um, even in our day, a slap in the face does not necessarily mean a literal slap, does it? Okay, what does it mean? Disrespect, it means a slight. Somebody slighted you, didn't they? Uh, so if you look at what Jesus was basically saying here, uh, and I put it like this in, in your notes. This is Corey's version. Did someone insult you? Let him, Jesus says. Are you shocked and offended? Don't be. And don't return insult for insult. Turn the other cheek. Look the other way. Let it go, is what it was saying. You've seen the movie Frozen? You know, sing the song. Let it go, let it go. Right. The cold never bothered me anyway. Who knew we needed all these thousands of years to get that song to be able to teach us something about the Bible. Um, but it's talking about here in personal things against you that you ought not retaliate against that. That is a really hard thing for us to, to grasp. But Jesus is addressing the need for true transformation versus just us keeping a certain rule that we may have somewhere it is not enough to obey the letter of the law. We must conform to the spirit of the law as well. And the fact of the matter is, folks, that Christians are called to be different. And if, and if you thought when you became a Christian that somehow that you going down to an altar and praying a prayer 
gave you some get out of jail free card that you could just put in your pocket and get up and still live the exact same way that you were living prior to you getting that card, then you were misinformed. The Bible and salvation and Christianity implies that we are different from people who are not. And so in these scriptures, Jesus is calling us to act like that. That means you have to do something that is counter to how you would ordinarily do it. If somebody in your B.C. days before Christ slaps you, then you may say, you got it coming, and slap them. But as a Christian, and I mean as a physical slight or personal slight, as a Christian, we are required. We are commanded to act differently. It's not. You can't say, well, yeah, I just, like I did, well, I, I don't think that's what, I'm going to go with what my mama said. Try. You can delete this verse. You can just buffet it and say, I'm going to apply this. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to apply this verse, but I'm going to apply those other verses that say that, you know, ask anything in my name and it'll be given to you. You know, you like that one. You know, things like that. The Bible is taken in its, in its totality. We don't like what Jesus is saying here, and you don't need to really get too crazy. He's not saying that you ought to be beat or let somebody beat on you. That is not what he is talking about. He is trying to teach in this sermon a principle that we are to humble and lessen ourselves and that we are to rely on him, the one that fights our battles, not us, but unlike we should have to retaliate against anything that is said or done against us. He told us in his word that we would be persecuted. At what point did Jesus ever say that you should take up arms against those who are persecuting you? You know what he said? Pray for them. And we go, oh, that's not enough. We got to do it because, you know, we got to get revenge. What's the Bible say about revenge, Mary Beth? Vengeance, she has to repeat that self to her life. <laughs> Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. You know what the other part of that verse, and Mary Beth, you got to start quoting that whole piece. Uh, and there he says, it is mine to avenge or to repay. The, he says, it is mine. And I thought when I read that part, I said, oh, I'll sign up for that because he can get you a lot better than I can get you. So if you want somebody to get God, you need to let God get them. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> okay? You know, if you say, well, I'm going to punch him, I mean, he may have something worse. If you want to really be mean, just let him go after him. You know, on there. But, you know, don't be surprised. God delivers a lot of grace, a lot more than we ever do. Okay? This is pray for those who persecute you. Man, that's living different. You think our world would be different if people were acting like that all the time? If we were not eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth people, if we were not just loving those who love us. You know, look at what he says in, these, in the verses here uh, in verse 46. Put that on the screen for me, Jay. If you love those who love you, what's the, what's the question? You, He says, even, are not even the tax collectors doing that? Why do he say tax collectors? <laughs> they were not, very, not like very much then, and they're not like very much now. <laughs> okay, they, uh, never has been a really wonderful profession uh, to have been in. They were, they were just like way more back then than they were uh, than they even are to this day uh, because they were really, really cheating people in an immense way, and they were their own folks. They were Jews that were doing this to their own Jewish people uh, for, for profit, and that, that, so that was in their context. But what Jesus is, is talking to us about uh, here is that we would be different, that we would operate in a different way. And, and folks, if you are calling yourself a Christian, this message today is for Christians. It's not for non-Christians because I would expect a non-Christian to not act like one. But I do expect that Christians act like one. And what does a Christian mean? To be a follower of Christ to be Christ-like. If you are claiming to be a Christian, but acting like a tax collector, 
which one are you? Well, you know, you may not be, but one would wonder, right? We would think it, maybe you thought it was still Halloween and you were just parading as a tax collector. But that's what Jesus has said, that he looked at the Pharisees and he said, you're like whitewashed tombs. On the outside, everything looks good, but on the inside, you're full of dead men's bones. We've got to be careful that we're not just parading to be Christians, but inwardly, we're worldly. Because, see, our transformation takes place from the inside out, not the outside in. You've got to have a change of heart. The Bible says that out of the overflow of a man's heart doth his mouth speak. So if somebody's speaking a lot of things that are horrible, what do you imply from that? That the heart has an issue. It, how you act is a product of who you are on the inside. And we all struggle with that. That's the battle of sanctification. Sometimes you know for a fact that you and I as well say and do things that are counter to who we are as Christians. There is no doubt about that. But, we, but if we are Christians, the Holy Spirit, and we talked about this on Wednesday night, that God speaking to you and things of this nature and feeling the presence of the Holy Spirit manifest in your life, the Holy Spirit will deliver you a butt whipping. Done it to you, he's done it to me. Some of those things when the Holy Spirit manifests himself, I'm like, no, no, please. You know, uh, just, I don't want it. But uh, he, he'll correct you. I am so thankful to those times of correction. Because let me tell you something, if the Holy Spirit is active in your life in that way, then you probably know you're saved. Because he's trying to keep you, in the, he's trying to keep you on the right, right road. Turning the other cheek uh, is not passive. It's not, he's not trying to say that we should put ourselves in danger. Uh, Jesus simply uh, wanted, wanted us to not retaliate for our own personal offenses. Responding to hatred with love and ignoring personal uh, slights display the supernatural power of the indwelling Holy Spirit and may afford the chance to share the gospel. So you think about that. I bolded that in your notes. You think about that. You think about when you go to eat at a restaurant and that food takes a little bit longer than it should. And you're eating on a Sunday, you know, in a plastic bubble nowadays is what you have to do if you're going in a restaurant. But you're eating in there. Food's taking a little bit longer. Sunday, you're dressed in your Sunday clothes. You're talking about, you know, how crazy Corey was, you know, and what the things that he had said. So they know you just left church. And here's this person who's working. They have been working all day. You, they probably didn't get to go to church today, even if they wanted to. And the food's just, just a little bit later than it should be, and so they forgot something. You had a personal slight against you. I'm paying for this. I'm supposed to have my service. It's supposed to be good. So what do you do to that person? You know, maybe they even were rude. Let's say, I don't know. Maybe they just didn't care. Maybe they didn't even say sorry. Are we supposed to to, to just eat them up one side and down the other and talk ugly to them and say, you know, you, know what, you should be fired. Let me, get your, let me get your manager and say, you know what, you ought to write this person up. Or are we to personally attack them and, and, and bring them down? Is that how a Christian reacts? Huh? Oh, y'all say no. You say no. But that ain't how you act. That ain't how you act on Sunday. I've been with some of y'all eating. Mm, I say it all the time. I said this before, not just about you. Ask a waiter or a waitress, what's the worst day to work? Sunday. We ought to be ashamed. Ought to be ashamed. Worst day to work on Sunday. It's not because of the. It ain't. It's not because of the uh, of the people that are worldly that they have a problem with. Sunday, the particular issue at hand is because Christians are there. Quote. What did Jesus say? That is a time that you may be able to deliver grace to that person. And they don't, you know what grace is? You know what, you know what the definition of it? You know what the definition is. Say it loud. Unearned favor. Unearned favor. It means favor that you did not deserve. And so I'm not saying that that waiter or waitress or that person, whomever it may be, whatever context you want to put this in, I'm not saying they deserve the favor. I'm saying we're supposed to give it to them. 
We're required to do that. Why? Because we've been given it freely. We, you should give because freely you have received. And if we're not doing that, if we're not operating like that, why are we expecting the world to be different? If we're not going to lead by example, and I'm telling you folks, divorce, high in the churches, it is outside, okay? You, you, so that, that's one thing. Sin, in the church like crazy, put, the church is putting stamps on it, you're having clergy, it's okay to be sinful, and whatever the things are that are out there uh, that you can imagine, all the list of sins, that it's okay even the pastor to engage in all that, oh, give him a break, and let him, let him continue to lead, it's okay. You have people in places of business saying, Sunday, worst, places to, worst time to work, because Christians are going, and y'all want to talk about that the world has got the problems? I think the problem is us. We should be leading by example. Seems like we're leading them in the, in the way they're going. Seems like the world is just conforming right on to them. Right, they're supposed to be conforming to us. But it requires, it don't require just your preacher. It requires you, when you leave here, to act like you are a Christian. Every single one of us. And when we don't do that, they don't listen to us anymore because we have lost their respect. And when they lose the respect that we had, then guess what? That puts them even further away from the message of, God, of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it is just nuts to me that I hear Christians all the time talking about the direction of this world and the direction of this country is going. But yet I just see a, a, a devolution of how we, how we think sin should be and, and all the rest of it. No, I, I don't make excuses for sin. I also don't sit here and, and just simply preach to people that are coming on Sunday morning to church uh, and beat you up all the time about sin, 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 sin. We know sin's a problem. Good grief, it's been a problem since Genesis chapter 3. I'm not preaching to you every single Sunday about coming to church because guess what? You're here. I'll do that for just a live stream service only. But I will preach over and over that we have a responsibility to show ourselves to be different. Uh, and that is exactly what Jesus is talking about in this verse. What did Jesus say to us? He said to us that we should be different in how we act. You want to know? When, when, when they come up uh, to Jesus, the woman, that they drug to Jesus. And they said, we have caught her in the act of adultery. Did they say we think she may be guilty of adultery? They caught him in the act. They drug her before Jesus. What did they want him to do to her? Wasn't it the law? Wasn't that what she deserved? Didn't Jesus know that? He gets down on his knee, writes something in the sand. Those without sin cast the first stone. And you say, well, you know, you're making too much of that. When, he, when she was down there, he looked at her and he says, woman, I'm just going to quote the play. Woman, where are thine accusers? And there's a break in between those two lines because she had to look. And she looked around and she says, I have no one, Lord. And what was his next words? What? What, what Daniel? Neither do, I. Neither do I condemn you. Huh. That's odd. She should have been stoned, clearly. It's written in the law. Legal. It's legal. But you don't stop there, see? People, don't, people that are legalistic, they don't like you to tell that story because that's a clear example of Jesus giving grace. But fear not, our Lord is not an idiot. When she got up to leave, what are the words he left her with? He left her with the standard, go and sin no more. Romans 6.23 says, I mean, Romans 3.26 says, for all have, uh, for the way, I mean, we have all sinned, E.D., past tense, and fallen short of the glory. It does not say we continue to sin and fall short of the glory of God every day. 
That's not what it said. And if you thought that's what Paul meant, he told you in Romans 6, what shall we say then? Shall we continue to sin so that grace may abound? By no means. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Okay? But see, that goes for the church. It goes for the church. We can't allow sin to be rampant in our buildings and leading in these ways. And I'm just, I'm asking you all today to think about this stuff. Um, if we're going to call ourselves Christians, we've got to act like it. And put that into the context of what I was talking to you about this morning in the beginning. We have a responsibility of leadership right now in the world uh, <clears throat> because, yeah, our politics and our government and all that have been, you know, doing a lot of things that the church is supposed to be doing. And I talked to you about the separation of church and state. We, we, we don't need to just keep sitting back thinking. And for four, pa, pra, past four years, we got, we got lazy. We thought, oh, Donald Trump was elected. He'll do everything that's right and good and champion every Christian cause. We won't have to worry about reading our Bibles anymore. We won't have to worry about doing anything that Christians do because he'll do it all. And now that he may be gone, we're despairing. Oh no, where's our puppet? What are you talking about? I never thought of him to be that way. Surely you didn't either in the way I just said it, I hope. Or you're crazy. But it, I don't care who the president is. I'm still going to serve the Lord in the same way I have always have. If I'm going to pray for one, I'm going to pray for the other. If I'm going to call balls and strikes. If one does a good job, I'm going to say it. If Trump did a bad job, I said it. And people say, oh, look at you. You're not a Christian because you, What? We've got, we are required to act like Christ, not act like our presidents. Presidents come and go, but Jesus Christ remains. And right now, let's just say for the lack of looking at everything else that may be out there, that we have a different president. What does that change in how we're to be operating for Jesus Christ? What does it change? I'm going to pray for him harder. If I think he's doing things that God doesn't want him to do, I will be more active. Get up. So maybe that's what we needed. Maybe that's what God needed is for the people to get up and say, oh, you thought that you had a political savior. No, no, no. You don't have a political savior. I'm your savior. Remember, that's the way Jesus, when, the, when, the, when he comes next time, it'll be on a horse. That's going to be the end, Jesus Christ. So maybe... Maybe it's to show us the work needs to be done by us. The, the president never goes out there in the highways and byways and compels them to come in and tries to save people and evangelize and all the rest of that. That's our jobs. And do not let politics, as I said in my Facebook post from yesterday, do not let politics trump your faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I can't, amen. Uh, <clears throat> I, 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 won't, I just can't say it more plainly. Can't say it more plainly. They're looking at us. They're looking at us right now. How are we going to react? Are we going to react like they did? Like spoiled bratted babies? Well, we have done it before. We did it when Obama was elected. Hey, the Christian, he's a Muslim, all these other things. We've been a part of that kind of stuff too. I'm talking about on the political sides. I'm telling you, that's, that is separate from your faith and, and all that. You can, be, you can come to this church and be of any kind of political party as just like we let any football fan people in here. Okay? Ain't about it. Ain't about that. Ain't about that. We as Christians, I'm not talking about as Republicans because I have no idea how y'all vote, but as Christians, they're looking at us. They're looking to see if we are going to act like all the Republicans act, because it seems like that skews that way, yeah. They're watching. They're watching what you put on Facebook. And yes, it's okay for them to go out there and put something like that because that's the way they ought to act. But it hurts our witness if we act like the world. And then you turn around the next post and you're putting a Bible scripture out there. 
You think they're listening to you? Why should they? You're just acting like one of them. So I'm telling you, when Jesus said those things, he meant it. And when he inspired Paul to write in Romans 1 that we are to submit to our government authorities, that's what they meant. And if you will put your eyes on Christ and his glory, what did the song say? The things of this world will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. I'm hopeful. I'm happy. I'm wonderful because I know the plan that Jesus Christ has and I'm going to be about his business every single day. Let's pray. Father God, we do praise you and we thank you, Lord, uh, for the, the reading of your word today. And Father, I just pray that we would take these, these hard scriptures for us to understand, uh, Lord, when it really goes counter to, our, to who we are as human beings, to think about if somebody personally slights us, that we're to not retaliate. To think about if somebody wants to unjustly sue us, Lord, or, or to just borrow money. And these the examples that were given, uh, Lord, that we would not respond and fight. Uh, Lord, and, and your word doesn't tell us that we're to be hopeless and helpless. It's that your word tells us that you will fight our battles for us. That we should trust in you for your leadership and for, and, and for your guidance every day in our life. And Lord, I just pray, uh, pray right now as, as we are all here that, Father, we know without a shadow of a doubt that you are in absolute, absolute control of this world, of this universe, that you are sovereign. And that, Father, that we can trust that no matter what happens across our world in, in political climates and whatever the case may be, that nothing is going to grab the control of this world out of your hands. So, Lord, we can trust you today. Father, we ask that you would lead us and you would guide us. You would help us to lessen ourselves so that we can be filled with your Holy Spirit, that we would be beacons of light in this lost and dying world. We can proclaim your gospel message, Lord. We could stand up for you where we should stand up for you, Lord, that we could be your mouthpieces, that we can be instruments of your will. And Lord, we may need that in a, in a greater degree than we have in the years before. Who knows? But Lord, we want to be ready. And Father, I just pray that you would help us to protect our witness and what we say, no matter what the context is. Uh, Father, that we would realize that we are Christians before we're anything else. And that, Lord, that we should treat other people with the same agape love, unconditional love that you have displayed to us. And that, Lord, that you would help us to find areas to where we need to deliver grace and mercy to people, even when they may not deserve it. Go with us, Lord, as when we leave this place today. Keep us safe. Bring us back tomorrow as we come to study your word and Bible study. And we just thank you for all that you do for us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.